This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Five, Part One. Towards the close of the reign of Charles the Second, some Whigs, who had been deeply implicated in the plot so fatal to their party, and who knew themselves to be marked out for destruction, had sought an asylum in the Low Countries. These refugees were, in general, men of fiery temper and weak judgment. They were also, under the influence of that peculiar illusion which seems to belong to their situation, politician driven into banishment by a hostile faction, generally sees the society which he has quitted through a false medium. Every object is distorted and discoloured by his regrets, his longings, and his resentments. Every little discontent appears to him to portend a revolution. Every riot is a rebellion. He cannot be convinced that his country does not pine for him, as much as he pines for his country. He imagines that all his old associates, who still dwell at their homes and enjoy their estates, are tormented by the same feelings which make life a burden to himself. The longer his expatriation, the greater does this hallucination become. The lapse of time, which cools the ardour of the friends whom he has left behind, inflames his. Every month his impatience to revisit his native land increases, and every month his native land remembers and misses him less. This delusion becomes almost a madness, when many exiles who suffer in the same cause herd together in a foreign country. Their chief employment is to talk of what once they were, and of what they may yet be to goad each other into animosity against the common enemy, to feed each other with extravagant hopes of victory and revenge. Thus they become ripe for enterprises which would at once be pronounced hopeless by any man whose passions had not deprived him of the power of calculating chances. In this mood were many of the outlaws who had assembled on the continent. The correspondence which they kept up with England was, for the most part, such as tended to excite their feelings and to mislead their judgment. Their information concerning the temper of the public mind was chiefly derived from the worst members of the Whig party, from men who were plotters and libellers by profession, who were pursued by the officers of the justice, who were forced to skulk in disguise through back streets, and who sometimes lay hid for weeks together in cockloughs and cellars. The statesmen who had formerly been the ornaments of the country party, the statesmen who afterwards guided the councils of the convention, would have given advice very different from that which was given by such men as John Wildman and Henry Danvers. Wildman had served forty years before in the parliamentary army, but had been more distinguished there as an agitator than as a soldier, and had early quitted the profession of arms for pursuits better suited to his temper. His hatred of monarchy had induced him to engage in a long series of conspiracies, first against the protector, and then against the Stuarts. But with Wildman's fanaticism was joined a tender care for his own safety. He had a wonderful skill in grazing the edge of treason. No man understood better how to instigate others to desperate enterprises by words which, when repeated to a jury, might seem innocent or, at worst, ambiguous. Such was his cunning that, though always plotting, though always known to be plotting, and though long malignantly watched by a vindictive government, he eluded every danger and died in his bed after having seen two generations of his accomplices die on the gallows. Danvers was a man of the same class, hot-headed but faint-hearted, constantly urged to the brink of danger by enthusiasm, and constantly stopped on that brink by cowardice. He had considerable influence among a portion of the Baptists, 
had written largely in defence of their peculiar opinions, and had drawn down on himself the severe censure of the most respectable Puritans, by attempting to palliate the crimes of Matthias and John of Leyden. It is probable that, had he possessed a little courage, he would have trodden in the footsteps of the wretches whom he defended. He was, at this time, concealing himself from the officers of justice, for warrants were out against him on account of a grossly calumnous paper of which the government had discovered him to be the author. It is easy to imagine what kind of intelligence and counsel men such as have been described were likely to send to the outlaws in the Netherlands. Of the general character of those outlaws an estimate may be formed from a few samples. One of the most conspicuous amongst them was John Ayloff a lawyer connected by affinity with the Hydes, and through the Hydes with James. Eiloff had made himself remarkable by offering a whimsical insult to the government, at a time when the ascendancy of the court of Versailles had excited general uneasiness. He had contrived to put a wooden shoe, the established type among the English, of French tyranny, into the chair of the House of Commons. He had subsequently been concerned in the Whig plot, but there is no reason to believe that he was a party to the design of assassinating the royal brothers. He was a man of parts and courage, but his moral character did not stand high. The Puritan divines whispered that he was a careless Gallio, or something worse, and that whatever zeal he might profess for civil liberty, the saints would do well to avoid all connection with him. Nathaniel Wade was, like Eiloff, a lawyer. He had long resided at Bristol, and had been celebrated in his own neighbourhood as a vehement Republican. At one time he had formed a project of emigrating to New Jersey, where he expected to find institutions better suited to his taste than those of England. His activity in electioneering had introduced him to the notice of some Whig nobles. They had employed him professionally, and had, at length, admitted him to their most secret councils. He had been deeply concerned in the scheme of insurrection, and had undertaken to head a rising in his own city. He had also been privy to the more odious plot against the lives of Charles and James, but he always declared that, though privy to it, he had abhorred it, and had attempted to dissuade his associates from carrying their design into effect. For a man bred to civil pursuits, Wade seems to have had, in an unusual degree, that sort of ability and that sort of nerve which make a good soldier. Unhappily, his principles and his courage proved to be not of sufficient force to support him when the fight was over, and when, in a prison, he had to choose between death and infamy. Another fugitive was Richard Goodenough, who had formerly been under Sheriff of London. On this man his party had long relied for services of no honourable kind, and especially for the selection of jurymen not likely to be troubled with scruples in political cases. He had been deeply concerned in those dark and atrocious parts of the Whig plot, which had been carefully concealed from the most respectable Whigs. Nor is it possible to plead, in extenuation of his guilt, that he was misled by inordinate zeal for the public good, for it will be seen that after having disgraced a noble cause by his crimes, he betrayed it in order to escape from his well-merited punishment. Very different was the character of Richard Rumbold. He had held a commission in Cromwell's own regiment, had guarded the scaffold before the banqueting-house on the day of the great execution, had fought at Dunbar and Worcester, and had always shown, in the highest degree, the qualities which distinguished the invincible army in which he served. Courage, of the truest temper, fiery enthusiasm, both political and religious, and with that enthusiasm all the power of self-government which is characteristic of men trained in well-disciplined camps to command and to obey. When the Republican troops were disbanded, Rumbold became a maltster, and carried on his trade near Hodston. In that building from which the Rye House plot derives its name, it had been suggested, though not absolutely determined, in the conferences of the most violent and unscrupulous of the malcontents, that armed men should be stationed in the Rye House, 
to attack the guards who were to escort Charles and James from Newmarket to London. In these conferences, Rumbold had borne a part from which he would have shrunk with horror, if his clear understanding had not been overclouded, and his manly heart corrupted by party spirit. A more important exile was Ford Grey, Lord Grey of Wark. He had been a zealous exclusionist, had concurred in the design of insurrection, and had been committed to the tower, but had succeeded in making his keepers drunk, and in effecting his escape to the continent. His parliamentary abilities were great, and his manners pleasing, but his life had been sullied by a great domestic crime. His wife was a daughter of the noble house of Berkeley. Her sister, the Lady Henrietta Berkeley, was allowed to associate and correspond with him, as with the brother by blood. A fatal attachment sprang up. The high spirit and strong passions of Lady Henrietta broke through all the restraints of virtue and decorum. A scandalous elopement disclosed to the whole kingdom the shame of two illustrious families. Grey and some of his agents who had served him, in his amour, were brought to trial on a charge of conspiracy. A scene unparalleled in our legal history was exhibited in the court of King's Bench. The seducer appeared with dauntless front, accompanied by his paramour. Nor did the great Whig lords flinch from their friend's side, even in that extremity. Those whom he had wronged stood over against him, and were moved to transports of rage by the sight of him. The old Earl of Berkeley poured forth reproaches and curses on the wretched Henrietta. The Countess gave evidence broken by many sobs, and at length fell down in a swoon. The jury found a verdict of guilty. When the court rose, Lord Berkeley called on all his friends to help him to seize his daughter. The partisans of Grey rallied round her. Swords were drawn on both sides. A skirmish took place in Westminster Hall, and it was with difficulty that the judges and tipstaves parted the combatants. In our time, such a trial would be fatal to the character of a public man. But in that age, the standard of morality among the great was so low, and party spirit was so violent, that Grey still continued to have considerable influence. Though the Puritans, who formed a strong section of the Whig party, looked somewhat coldly on him. One part of his character, or rather it may be of the fortune of Grey, deserves notice. It was admitted that everywhere, except on the field of battle, he showed a high degree of courage. More than once, in embarrassing circumstances, when his life and liberty were at stake, the dignity of his deportment, and the perfect command of all his faculties, extorted praise from those who neither loved nor esteemed him. But as a soldier, he incurred less, perhaps, by his fault than by mischance, the degrading imputation of personal cowardice. In this respect, he differed widely from his friend the Duke of Monmouth. Ardent and intrepid on the field of battle, Monmouth was everywhere else effeminate and irresolute. The accident of his birth, his personal courage, and his superficial graces, had placed him in a post for which he was altogether unfitted. After witnessing the ruin of the party, and of which he had been the nominal head, he had retired to Holland. The Prince and Princess of Orange had now ceased to regard him as a rival. They received him most hospitably, for they hoped that by treating him with kindness they should establish a claim to the gratitude of his father. They knew that paternal affection was not yet wearied out, that letters and supplies of money still came secretly from Whitehall to Monmouth's retreat, and that Charles frowned on those who sought to pay their court to him by speaking ill of his banished son. The Duke had been encouraged to expect that, in a very short time, if he gave no new cause of displeasure, he would be recalled to his native land, and restored to all his high honours and commands. Animated by such expectations, he had been the life of the Hague during the late winter. He had been the most conspicuous figure at a succession of balls in that splendid orange hall, which blazes on every side with the most ostentatious colouring of Jordans and Honthurst. He had taught the English country dance to the Dutch ladies, and had, in his turn, learned from them to skate on the canals. The princess had accompanied him 
in his expeditions on the ice, and the figure which he made there, poised on one leg and clad in petticoats shorter than they are generally worn by ladies so strictly decorous, had caused some wonder and mirth to the foreign ministers. The sullen gravity which had been the characteristic of the stadtholder's court seemed to have vanished before the influence of the fascinating Englishman. Even the stern and pensive William relaxed into good humour when his brilliant guest appeared. Monmouth, meanwhile, carefully avoided all that could give offence in the quarter to which he looked for protection. He saw little of any Whigs, and nothing of those violent men he had been concerned with in the worst part of the Whig plot. He was therefore loudly accused by his old associates of fickleness and ingratitude. By none of the exiles was this accusation urged with more vehemence and bitterness than by Robert Ferguson, the Judas of Dryden's great satire. Ferguson was by birth a Scot, but England had long been his residence. At the time of the Restoration, indeed, he had held a living in Kent. He had been bred a Presbyterian, but the Presbyterians had cast him out, and he had become an independent. He had been master of an academy which the dissenters had set up at Islington as a rival to Westminster School and the Charter House, and he had preached to large congregations at a meeting-house in Moorfields. He had also published some theological treatises, which may still be found in the dusty recesses of a few old libraries. But, though texts of scripture were always on his lips, those who had pecuniary transactions with him soon found him to be a mere swindler. At length he turned his attention almost entirely from theology, to the worst part of politics. He belonged to the class whose office it is to render in troubled times to exasperated parties those services from which honest men shrink in disgust and prudent men in fear, the class of fanatical knaves, violent, malignant, regardless of truth, insensible to shame, insatiable of notoriety, delighting in intrigue, in tumult, in mischief for its own sake. He toiled during many years in the darkest minds of faction. He lived among libellers and false witnesses. He was the keeper of a secret purse from which agents too vile to be acknowledged received hire, and the director of a secret press whence pamphlets bearing no name were daily issued. He boasted that he had contrived to scatter lampoons about the terrace of Windsor, and even to lay them under the royal pillow. In this way of life he was put to many shifts, was forced to assume many names, and at one time had four different lodgings in different corners of London. He was deeply engaged in the Rye House plot. There is indeed reason to believe that he was the original author of those sanguinary schemes which brought so much discredit on the whole Whig party. When the conspiracy was detected, and his associates were in dismay, he bade them farewell with a laugh, and told them that they were novices, that he had been used to flight, concealment, and disguise, and that he should never leave off plotting while he lived. He escaped to the continent, but it seemed that even on the continent he was not secure. The English envoys at foreign courts were directed to be on the watch for him. The French government offered a reward of five hundred pistoles to any one who would seize him. Nor was it easy for him to escape notice, for his broad Scotch accent, his tall and lean figure, his lantern jaws, the gleam of his sharp eyes, which were always overhung by his wig his cheeks inflamed by an eruption, his shoulders deformed by a stoop, and his gait distinguished from that of other men by a peculiar shuffle, made him remarkable wherever he appeared. But, though he was, as it seemed, pursued with peculiar animosity, it was whispered that this animosity was feigned, and that the officers of justice had secret orders not to see him, that he was really a bitter malcontent, can scarcely be doubted, but there is strong reason to believe that he provided for his own safety by pretending at Whitehall to be a spy on the Whigs, and by furnishing the government with just so much information as suffice to keep up his credit. This hypothesis furnishes a simple explanation of what seemed to his associates to be his unnatural recklessness and audacity. Being himself out of danger, he always gave his vote 
for the most violent and perilous course, and sneered very complacently at the pusillanimity of men who, not having taken the infamous precautions on which he relied, were disposed to think twice before they placed life, and objects dearer than life, on a single hazard. As soon as he was in the Low Countries, he began to form new projects against the English government, and found among his fellow emigrants men ready to listen to his evil counsels. Monmouth, however, stood obstinately aloof, and without the help of Monmouth's immense popularity, it was impossible to effect anything. Yet such was the impatience and rashness of the exiles, that they tried to find another leader. They sent an embassy to that solitary retreat on the shores of Lake Leman, where Edmund Ludlow, once conspicuous among the chiefs of the parliamentary army, and among the members of the High Court of Justice, had, during many years, hidden himself from the vengeance of the restored Stuarts. The stern old regicide, however, refused to quit his hermitage. His work, he said, was done. If England was still to be saved, she must be saved by younger men. End of part one.